Why this is Boris Johnson. Um, and it's because of the common sense fortune he's talking today, of the British people. And I'm going to be quiet and just listen. But earlier this year, we were able to avert an even worse catastrophe, forming a human shield around our NHS and then getting our country moving again by really BBC breaking of our news at 12:37 children to school. On the but we always knew that while we might have driven the virus into retreat, the prospect of a second wave was real. And I'm sorry to say that as in Spain and France and many other countries, we've reached... You need to read the bits on the bottom of the time. screen as well. I don't know if you can see them. A month ago, on average, around a 1,000 people across the UK were testing positive for coronavirus every day. The latest figure has almost quadrupled to 3,900. And 29. Yesterday, the chief medical officer and chief scientific advisor warned that the doubling rate for new cases could be between 7 and 20 days, with the possibility of tens of thousands of uh, new infections. Don't forget, they're month. guessing all of this. I wish I could reassure the House not facts. that the growing they're number guessing. of cases is merely a function of more testing. But a rising proportion of the tests themselves are yielding a positive <laughs> result. sleeping over there. I Tune also wish I could say that more of our people now have the um, maybe the music equipment at last. The virus off. Trying to do but something with it. But the latest data suggests that fewer than eight percent of us are in this position. It's true that the number of new cases is growing fastest amongst those aged 20 to 29. But the evidence shows that the virus is spreading to other more vulnerable age groups, as we have seen in France and Spain, okay. where this has led to increased hospital admissions and, sadly, more deaths. In the last fortnight, daily hospital admissions in England have more than doubled. How about Germany? Germany's had thousands of people out protesting. Wood, How many dropped me down dead? Because that's been going on for weeks. In November, and those numbers would continue to grow. And I've been on a few protests, and, and as with all I've got lung problems, viruses, and I've been standing in the back with loads of people, faster as getting on buses and trains, winter. without a mask, I can't breathe with a mask on. The UK's COVID alert level was raised from three to four, the second most serious stage, meaning that transmission is high or rising exponentially. So this is the moment when we must if we can curb the number of daily infections and reduce the reproduction rate to one... This is the man that goes around getting different women pregnant, producing loads of babies, he's not married, got no morals, would inevitably become necessary and he's our Prime Minister, so we're acting on our the leader. ...that a stitch in time saves nine. The government will introduce... I should have put that on there, shouldn't you? England, stitch time... Then you would have saved a few, to wouldn't you? Achieve the maximum reduction in the R number with the minimum damage to lives and livelihoods. I want to stress that this is by no means a return to the full lockdown of March. We're not issuing a general instruction to stay at home. We will ensure that schools, colleges and universities stay open because nothing is more important than the education, health and well-being of our young people. Uh, we will ensure that businesses can stay open in a COVID-compliant way. However, we must take action to suppress the disease. First, we are once again asking office workers who can work from home to do so in key public services and in all professions where home working is not possible, such as construction or retail, people should continue to attend their workplaces. And like government, this House will be free to take forward its business in a COVID-secure way, which you, Mr Speaker, have pioneered. Second, from Thursday, all pubs, bars and restaurants must operate a table service only, Mr Speaker, except for takeaways. Together with all hospitality venues, they must close at 10pm. So why have they got to close at 10? That means Where is that significant? And not just calling for last orders. Because why do you have to close at 10? Paramount. The same will apply to takeaways. Why do you have to close at 10? I'm sorry. If everything is open during the day, why do you have to close at 10? 
from being transmitted in bars and restaurants. But it's open till 10. Third, we will extend the So all day long you can sit and not catch the virus, but after 10 o'clock you will. All users of taxis and private hire vehicles and staff and customers in indoor hospitality, except when seated at a table to eat or drink. Fourth, Got to wear a mask. Leisure and tourism and other sectors, our COVID secure guidelines will become legal obligations. Businesses will be fined and could be closed if they breach the rules. Fifth, now is the time to tighten up the rule of six. I'm afraid that from Monday, a maximum of 15 people will be able to attend wedding ceremonies and receptions, though up to 30 I can still attend a funeral as now. We will also have to extend the rule of six to all adult indoor team sports. <clears throat> Finally, we have to acknowledge that the spread of the virus is now affecting our ability to reopen business conferences, exhibitions and large sporting events. So we will not be able to do this from the 1st of October and I recognise the implications for our sports clubs which are the life and soul of our communities and my right honourable friends, the Chancellor and Culture Secretary are working urgently on what we can do now to support them. Mr Speaker, these rules, these measures will only work if people comply. And though there is nothing more frustrating for the vast majority <clears throat> who do comply, the law abiding majority. Law abiding. Few law abiding. The but these are not laws. So these rules will be enforced by tighter Penalties. Oh, so they're going to enforce We've them. already introduced a fine of up to £10,000. <clears> £10,000. <000 laughs> £10, and such fines will now be applied to businesses breaking COVID rules. The penalty for failing to wear a mask or breaking the rule of six will now double to £200 for a first offence. We will provide the police and local authorities with the extra funding they need, a greater police presence on our streets, and the option to draw military support where required, where required to free up. Did you police. hear that? The option to call the military I've support. All apply in England and the devolved administrations. Didn't I tell you when I first steps. started so making I these that the, the army were about to come onto the streets? Today, and I thank them for their. They've been banking them up and they're not they British army, they're from foreign lands. Success. Already about 13 million people across England are living under various local restrictions over and above national measures. We will continue to act against local flare-ups, working alongside councils and strengthening measures where necessary. And I want to speak directly to those who were shielding early in the pandemic and who may be anxious about being at greater risk. Following advice from our senior clinicians, our guidance continues to be that you do not need to shield except in local lockdown areas and we will keep this under constant review. I must emphasise that if all our actions fail to bring the hour below one, then we reserve the right to deploy greater firepower with significantly greater restrictions. I fervently want to avoid taking this step, as do the devolved administrations, Lies. but we will only be able to avoid it if our new measures work and our behaviour changes. Oh, you bring the army in. Mr Speaker, we will spare no effort in developing vaccines, treatments, new forms of mass testing, <coughs> mass but unless testing. we palpably make progress, we should assume mass that the restrictions are announced will remain in place for perhaps six months. Six months. For the time being, so this the whole of 2020 is a fact of our lives, and I must tell the House and the country that our fight against it will continue. We will not listen to those who say let the virus rip, nor to those who urge a permanent lockdown. We are taking decisive and appropriate steps to balance saving lives with protecting jobs and livelihoods. Rubbish. I know all of this will have profound consequences for our constituents. So the government will give the House every opportunity to scrutinise our decisions. In addition to regular statements and debates, honourable members will be able to question the government's scientific advisers more regularly. 
gain access to data about their constituencies, your constituencies, and join daily calls with my right honourable friend, the Paymaster General. After six months of restrictions, it would be tempting to hope that the threat six has faded months and to seek comfort in the belief that if you have avoided that's the virus next March, so far, that's a whole you year. somehow immune. I have to say that it is that kind of complacency that could be our undoing. If we fail to act together now, we will not only place others at risk, but jeopardise our own futures with the more drastic action that we would inevitably be forced to take. Take the army. Mr Speaker, no British government would wish to stifle our freedoms in the way, in the ways that we have found necessary this year. Yet even now, we can draw comfort, some comfort, from the fact that schools and universities and places of worship are staying open. But even Shops now, Boris, your life just customers. carries on Construction as normal. can go to building sites, and the vast majority of the UK economy can continue moving forwards. We are also, Mr Speaker, better prepared for a second wave with the ventilators, the PPE, the dexamethasone, the Nightingale hospitals, and a hundred times as much testing as we began this epidemic with. So it now falls to each of us and every one of us to remember the basics. Wash our hands, cover our faces, observe social distancing and follow the rules. Then we can fight back against this virus, shelter our economy from even greater damage, protect the most vulnerable in care homes and hospitals, safeguard Protecting the care homes. And save many <coughs> You're killing them all and off, I mate. Commend this statement to the House. I now call the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Let's see what he's got to say. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of his statement and for his telephone call last night. Mr Speaker, the picture presented yesterday by this the our new Labour leader was stark and cannot be ignored. Infections are rising, hospitalisations are rising, the trajectory is clear. And we know from bitter experience what happens next. Do we? So it what is experience? right that the Prime Minister is announcing further measures Loads of empty hospitals and everyone clapping. support those measures. Just as we supported lockdown in March... Loads of doctors and nurses on TikTok dancing. Although we fierce criticism While people are supposed to be having these terrible deaths pandemic, in their wards. When restrictions are needed, the national interest lies in clear communications and cross-party support. They're all in with each other, aren't and they? And so we will, as we've done before, encourage people to follow the government guidance and obey the rule of law. Law! Mr Speaker, families across the country will be law. anxious today. Many are already living under local lockdowns. Many more fear that soon they will. They're worried about their jobs, about their loved ones, and whether they will be able to spend Christmas with their families. They will also be worried that the government doesn't have a clear strategy. One day people are encouraged to work in the office, in fact more than encouraged, who are openly challenged by the Prime Minister for not doing so. Today they're told the opposite. This is a time of national crisis, but we need clear leadership. So it's right the Prime Minister answer a number of serious questions about the next steps. First, a number of areas in England already have localised restrictions, including some that are very similar to those announced today. Pubs and restaurants in Bolton, for example, have been told to shut at 10pm for about two weeks. Leicester's been in localised restrictions for about three months, and yet the infections in those areas remain high. So can the Prime Minister be sure that the restrictions he's introducing today will be effective? Suppressing the what virus. difference does it make if a pub's open all day long and it closes at 10 o'clock? If a takeaway shop or restaurant or cafe is open all day long and it closes at 10 o'clock? On the hospitality sector, on high streets and town centres, on people's jobs... I'd say that that's because they don't want anyone on the streets after 10 o'clock because they're busy doing other things. So what other things are they doing where they don't want people up. about to see what they're doing? Will we now accept that we're drawing the furlough scheme? The next thing they're going to be telling us... ...would be a disaster, and actually at complete odds with the measures 
He's just announced the possibility... It's to close your curtains or black out your windows. Offer ...to work with him. And trade unions and businesses on a replacement scheme that protects jobs and, and businesses. Yeah, furl off. That's coming to an Mr. end. Speaker, given the rise in infection at the end of this the month, furl off is where you get paid for not going to work. But that's coming to a stop. So now we're going to go through six months by the autumn. of no one the having any money. The sciences told him the same in July. They said testing and tracing capacity will need to be significantly expanded to cope with the increased demands over the winter. But the government didn't listen. They pretended there wasn't a problem. They didn't act quickly enough. Now the testing system isn't working just when we need it. We should also recognise that a second national lockdown is not inevitable. That the testing the system not working. Failure of government, not an act of God. There is still time to prevent it. That must be a national effort. Labour will do whatever is reasonable and necessary to support that, to save lives, to protect the NHS. But the government must lead, and they must do so fast. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr uh, Speaker, I'm grateful to the right honourable gentleman for his support. Though I notice that it it seems to to come and go, but it seems to be it seems to be here to it seems to be here today. He he criticises uh, testing. He should he should know, Mr Speaker. That's that, bigger uh, than like, speaker, like don't they? Uh, many times, uh, <coughs> this country is now testing more than any other country in Europe. Uh, one one test for every every five people, and, and actually, uh, in spite of the massive increase in the demand for uh, for testing, uh, we have greatly increased the number of contacts that are being uh, being reached from the index cases. And I think you should pay tribute to those who are involved in the whole testing operation, in spite of all the difficulties that they face. He mentions the uh, the success of, of local lockdowns, and he's absolutely right to draw attention to what happened in. Leicester, uh, and that was a, a heroic effort of local people, and it's happened in other parts of the country, local people putting together to drive the virus down. That is what we uh, hope to encourage throughout the country, and that is uh, certainly part of our... <coughs> Funny, in Parliament, they forget to mention that to Leicester was also that discovered to have the, the most already, uh, slave labour uh, there in the clothing industry. Pounds, slaves. Jobs most the of them illegal the immigrants, but slaves sitting in front of a sewing machine. This country. And Mr Speaker, uh, I'm grateful, as I say, uh, for what he has, he has said, for the support such as it is uh, that, he has, uh, that he has offered. But what I can tell him uh, th is that in uh, putting forward the message of, of support, I hope he will also say to everybody uh, in his constituency uh, and elsewhere that this is a balanced and a proportionate response to the crisis that we face. Uh, we are driving the virus down. That is our objective by these measures. But we are also as I said, Mr. Speaker, keeping the vast majority of the UK economy going. That is our, our programme. That is what we intend to do. This is a package. This is a package to drive down the R, but also to allow education and jobs and uh, the growth to continue. That is absolutely vital uh, for the Right Honourable Gentleman to understand. And I hope in his support, which I welcome, uh, he will communicate that uh, to the country as well. Let's head to Amersham with Dame <coughs> Joel Gillen. Dame Joel Gillen. One of the most difficult decisions a Prime Minister has to take in a democracy is to restrict our freedoms for the greater good. And in the measures he's announced today and the cross-party consensus, I think my right honourable friend has sought balance and proportionality, as he says, protecting the economy whilst reducing the risk of the virus spreading like a wildfire. But with this six-month time frame he's announced, what does he say to grandparents who want to live their lives before it's too late and cannot see their families, to worried parents and families who cannot access a test at the moment, to workers and business owners facing financial ruin, and to MPs that want to debate these matters in Parliament before they are decided, not after, so they can help him shoulder this onerous responsibility. How can he convince all of them that he's taking the right path and unite our country with hope of an end to this misery. All these grandparents that are being uh, killed off. I, I thank my right honourable friend, and she's, she's entirely right that Parliament should and will uh, debate these issues, and Mr Speaker, we will make time early next week in, in government time uh, for a full debate on these, me on these measures. Leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of his statement. Uh, Mr Speaker, we have reached a critical moment. The virus has not gone away, it's not going away, <coughs> it remains as deadly as ever. 
I welcome the fact that following calls this weekend from our First Minister, a Four Nation Cobra meeting has taken place this morning. We have all witnessed the worrying rise in virus cases over the last number of weeks, and we all know that the projections and consequences our society will face if it continues to grow at the same rate. But we must also be clear about one thing. If we take the right actions now, there is nothing inevitable about the exponential spread of this virus. If we act decisively, if we move sharply, if we take the right tough decisions now, we can get the virus back under control. We can minimise the time we all spend under new restrictions and most importantly, we can save lives. Mr Speaker, today governments across the four nations are rightly asking citizens to make more it's lovely sacrifices day out today, to protect our collective health. A lovely day In return for these sacrifices, fast it is only right that citizens are provided walk. with financial support and the health that, yeah. and economic uncertainty. It's a dog's life, Speaker, yeah. We are now just a few short weeks away from the end of the furlough scheme. Analysis from the Scottish Government has mm, already shown off. that extending the scheme by eight months could save around 61,000 jobs in Scotland. France, Germany and Ireland have already extended their job retention schemes into next year. But the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have rigidly refused to extend furlough. But we all know that new terms and mixed messaging have come to define... So loads of people... The They're at the July, moment being paid to not go to work. Go back to work if you can. On the 14th of August, the Chancellor said it was crucial that we do our bit, such as going back to our place of work. And yep. on the 27th of August, government sources said, Don't. go back to work or risk losing, losing your, your job. job. The Prime Minister has changed his advice this morning on working from home. It is now time to change his mind on furlough as well. So today I have one question. And it's a question that 61,000 employees in Scotland are asking. Prime Minister, they deserve certainty and they deserve an answer. Will this government now save these jobs and extend the furlough scheme beyond October? So the thing is, with a furlough scheme, you get paid 80% of your wages. So if you was earning £300 a week or £200 a week, well, if you was earning £100 a week, you'd get paid £80. So if you were working and earning £200 a week, they'd pay you 160 yeah, to eight, 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 16, isn't it? 160. So, and, and that's how it goes. But, so you're going to go from, for instance, that's a low wage, £200 a week. So you're going to go from, you've already gone from £200 a week down to £160 a week. So you've already lost £40. So now you're going to be going down even more because if you're not getting paid furlough, 80% of your wages, then that means that you're going to have to go on to unemployment. <laughs> money <laughs> and unemployment money would take it down even lower so instead of 160 pounds a week you'd be getting 120 pounds a week and it's just getting worse isn't it in the devolved administrations about 12.6 billion pounds and we will continue so if you've got two people in a house, mum and dad working, to pay for a mortgage or whatever, or just to pay the rent, the rent in England is ridiculous, then um, both of you have lost money. Both of you are going to be unemployed. Now, if you've got a situation like what my friend's got, he's has, his wife works. He was in construction. And first lockdown, he was told he, he, was told he couldn't go work. So he applied for furlough, and they said, no, you can't have it with the job you got. You're self-employed and all that. And because your wife is still working... She's working How from home. Because she is still working and you have an income coming in, then you're not entitled to unemployment money, furlough money, no, nothing at all. Ten tests every three weeks. And they are worried that they may have people who are... But he's lost his job. He hasn't packed his job up or been given the sack. He's been told he cannot go to work. ...schools up and down the country that are trying so hard to do the right thing. Uh, Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend is, is absolutely right that... So, of course, uh, the money that they're used to having coming in to pay the bills, pay mortgages or whatever, it's now 
uh, teacher. Oh, it's not there, is it? As he knows, because they've only got her wage. That's a very important point about uh, about about uh, about school pupils, and there, there she's in a, sales. A fact, which is so actually, the rates of, not so much stuff uh, is being sold. So although you're getting a basic wage, you're not earning the incentives. In, in, uh, because you're not the, selling uh, it. Of the population. You're not but, selling uh, over I'm the odds. I'm not going to hide it from him that uh, the future I see for uh, our country the, and the way to defeat this virus is massively uh, to expand testing, and not just for teachers, and not just for in schools, uh, but throughout the country. And, and that is why I'm proud uh -huh. that uh, NHS tests and trace, in spite of all the difficulties which the right honourable gentleman and others have, have legitimately pointed out, NHS tests and trace. But isn't this like the, the flu? You can catch it, it get country. over should, it, and then catch it again a couple of so months later. Mr Speaker, there was one major omission from the Prime Minister's statement, an apology. So will the government now apologise for his government's gross incompetence over testing, over tracing, over clear communications that have led to these latest restrictions on people's daily lives? And Mr Speaker, as families and businesses look forward, especially to Christmas, how will the government support the millions of people who are on the brink of losing their jobs, losing their businesses, losing their livelihoods? What is the losing their lives? Hi, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the plan uh, is, is that we should continue <clears throat> to keep the economy moving in the way that I have described and the way that the government has set out, and which uh, I believe. So, you've got to wear a mask in a restaurant. Quite rightly, you can take it off while you're eating, the then you've got to put it back on down. again. That is our policy. Does he support it? Yeah. And they're saying this is. Airborne. Much, well, if this is airborne, that room that they're all sitting in has got COVID floating all over the place. But they're all sitting there with no masks on. One minute they're saying you get it by standing too close to someone and they breathe on you or spit on you or whatever by accident. Then they say, that's why everyone's got to wear a mask, in case they spit on someone. And now they're saying, then they're saying it's airborne. So you've got to wear a mask, even if you're not standing next to someone, because it's airborne. Over the weeks and months ahead. This is and just such a load of for lifting these restrictions tosh. And others like the rule of six. This is about ten o'clock curfew. This is about curfew. The next thing they're going to say is, "Oh, you can't go out at night." This is about curfew. This is about getting the army on the streets. Why do they want people off the streets and indoors before twelve at night? What you know, close at ten. Everything's closed. Time you get home and everything else like that. So what is going on all night? What is going on? I'm assuming that they're doing all this 5G stuff, but they've been doing that anyway. I know they are because I've got friends that are actually laying all these cables and have been for quite a few years. They've all been shipped over from South Africa. I might add that they're all really nice people that are doing these jobs, but they're, they're doing a job, aren't they? They're putting cables down. They've been doing it all over the country. The they, I've got a couple of really good friends that are doing this, putting all the 5G cables down. And for the last four years that I've known them, they've gone from Scotland, well, they're in um, Chelmsford and uh, Colchester and going down that way now. But they've been working up in Scotland. I've, I've stayed in contact with them all the time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and like I, I say, they've all been shipped in from uh, abroad. And, uh, and all the other uh, businesses involved, and uh, we are massively uh, putting all the cables down, testing the whole time, getting it all ready for five uh, G. I, I think it's very important for the highest to So now it's just a case of all the boxes being set up. I think what's happened is five G workers have been a bit frightened that they're going to get attacked while fitting, fitting these things up because there's been a lot going on on the internet about five G, five G, and a, and a few people are, I believe have been attacked. But um, they're not showing you on the news any of these uh, people that are marching, uh, what they showed about Trafalgar Square was um, that people were causing problems. But from the people that I've spoken to that were there, they're telling me it was the police that started the problems. And they were there. They were actually there. So I'll be there this uh, weekend, so I'll video it. To improve mental health care provision for all, which was supported mental by the health. Royal College of Psychiatrists. 
the people that have already got mental health before lockdown, before COVID appeared, don't get enough help. 